and welcome to State of the Economy, a show that connects you with key policy makers and thinkers. Today we have with us Dr. Narendra Jadav, a member of Planning Commission as well as a member of the National Advisory Council. Uh, he has been involved in the Planning Commission mainly uh, in education reforms uh, besides employment and labor, which are also his portfolios. But today uh, we will chiefly discuss uh, reforms in the ed education sector with Dr. Jalo. Uh, welcome to our Good show. Man. Will India achieve the much touted demographic dividend that we all talk about? Uh, first of all, let me clarify uh, that, um, you know, where we stand now in terms of our country, uh, we are enjoying demographic dividend, uh, as you have rightly said. The average age of India today is only 24, and the average age uh, by the year 2020 would be only 29 years. At which point, the average uh, median age for United States would be 37, for China it would be 38, for Western Europe it would be 42, and for Japan it would be 48. So we have a tremendous advantage in terms of having a large and growing young population. young population. This is what we call demographic dividend. Which will be both consumer as well as producer. Correct, correct. It is recognized at the highest policy making level in our country that this is an opportunity which comes once in a lifetime of a nation. Yeah. And we must harness that. And if we do not harness that, if we fail to harness this demographic dividend, demographic dividend can turn into a demographic, demographic nightmare. nightmare. That so that means important. what you're saying that we have a 10-year window, 15-year window? We have a 15-year window in which we are continue to, going to continue to have this demographic dividend, but this is a window of opportunity and we must harness it, uh, failing which I think the future generations will never forgive us. And this is recognized at the highest level and that is why it is clearly understood in the planning process where we are, as you are aware, we are just finishing the 11th five-year plan and we are currently working on the 12th five-year plan. It is recognized that unless we put our house in order as far as the education and skill development sector is concerned, yeah. there is just no way we can harness this demographic dividend, yeah. nor is it going to be possible for us to sustain the high economic growth that we have achieved in the last few years. Yeah. Dr. Jalil, in this context, yeah. Can you just give us an idea of what sort of scaling up of supply in the education sector would be required to meet this demographic dividend? In this context, just one data point uh, which is really disappointing uh, is that gross enrollment ratio in India is just 20%, mm -hmm. which is uh, half of the world average as you uh, just told me uh, yeah. before we started the interview. Right. And probably two thirds of the developing country average. Mm -hmm. Let me say this, uh, in terms of the absolute size India has now become the second largest education sector in the world in terms of higher education. The total population, total number of students that we have is about little more than 20 million. And if you take the open and distance education, then add four more million. So we have little more than 24 million. Uh, it's hard to believe. But the total number of uh, students that we have enrolled is slightly higher than that of United States, uh, but less, much less than what is there in China. Okay. Now that is in terms of the absolute number. Absolutely. That of course relates as to the population. As a ratio, as I was, uh, as we were discussing earlier, GR, the gross enrollment ratio today is about. Uh, if you take the age group of 18 to 22 okay. as the age group for higher education, in that age group. Uh, the GR computed today is about 20%, which is only one half yeah. of the world average, and it is also only two thirds of the average for developing so countries. How do you scale it up? We need to increase the GR, and that's why major expansion is required. We have started major expansion in the 11th plan, and the same process is going to continue in the 12th five year plan. So, you need more For universities, in, more colleges, partly. More, more yeah, that, is, that is absolutely necessary, yeah. but that's not sufficient. Yeah. Uh, just to give you some idea about what we are planning, is that in the 12th plan, we want to take the total level of uh, the absolute level of enrollment uh, from in the traditional education from 20 million to 30 million. Okay. We want to take the GR to 30 percent. 
at which time it would be close to the GER of China by the time China may go even higher. In the next 10 years, you in say? The next, no, in the next five years, we five want years. to take it from 20% to 30%. Yeah. So there's a big challenge involved and that would require enormous investment in the education sector. Okay. Okay. Can we, uh, to, to enable this, yeah. this, this measure of scale up or this kind of scale up, do you think a total funding of less than 2% of GDP uh, mm. for center and states is mm. enough? Uh, no, certainly not. So what, what kind of additional funding will be required? No, addition, no let, let me also add, before we go to the funding aspect, let me also add a big challenge that we need to face. Uh, not only in terms of quantity, uh, also in terms of its regional distribution. Okay. As I said, the no, GDR... We will come to regional distribution, but can you give no, us but an that idea is, of... Uh, see, that's the, part of the challenge. The yeah. financing cannot be independent okay. of, of the regional distribution. Okay. That's why I, I want to, to highlight that, yeah. that if you... Our GR, as I said, at national level, is about 20%, yeah. which looks impressive enough, but not very impressive. Yeah. Uh, not, not uh, if you break it down in terms of male, female, urban, rural, uh, in terms of scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, minorities, uh, denotified and nomadic tribes, the picture that emerges is appalling. There are huge strata of society where there are very large sections of society where GR is less than 3%. You take scheduled tribe women in the rural area, mm -hmm. there the GR would be 3 to 4%. Uh, now, which means that there are sections of society where at this point of time we have 96 to 97 percent people do not even have access to higher education. Yeah, yeah. Do you realize the enormity of challenges? This is in there? terms of strata of society but also in terms of states. Terms uh, of all states. universities yes. seem to be concentrated in about five states and many other sta states don't have a single university. There is a highly skewed distribution. Today we have about 634 universities and about 34,000 plus uh, number of colleges, which is large enough. But their distribution is not uniform. It is highly skewed. And then another distinction that comes in, in, in terms of uh, the quality differential is, you know, there, there are universities which are central universities, then yeah. there are state universities, then there are uh, deemed universities, and then there are private state, private so universities. Yeah, we'll, we'll go uh, in greater so, detail uh, okay. on this distribution. All right. But uh, after a small break, uh, please uh, don't go away. Keep watching Raj Sabha Television. Welcome back to State of the Economy. We are having a conversation with Dr. Narendra Jadav, member of Planning Commission and member of the National Advisory Council. Dr. Jadav, we were discussing uh, uh, the skewed distribution of uh, mm -hmm. uh, education in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we were also uh, discussing uh, the need to scale up mm -hmm. uh, education in a big way. Mm -hmm. uh, for that, financing is, is a key aspect. Absolutely. Now, please give us an idea of what kind of financing additional financing will be required in terms of uh, ratio of GDP in the next five to ten years when India would like to enhance or increase its enrollment ratio to 30 percent as you as you said. Uh, well we are in the process of calculating that but let me give you a perspective on that. Um, you know long long ago I think way back in 1966 there was a very important commission appointed Kothari, Kothari Commission. Commission yeah. Kothari Commission had suggested that we should be spending on entire education uh, primary, secondary, higher and technical, everything together, 6% of GDP. Yeah. You'll be surprised that uh, we have been stuck at 3.5%. Okay. We started, in spite of all the lofty talk, quite frankly, until the 11th five-year plan, we have simply not been spending enough on education yeah. sector. Yeah. Now, the process started in big way in the 11th five-year plan. For example, the education outlay in the 11th five-year plan was eight times the outlay in the 
ninth uh, in the uh, tenth five year plan. And this 3% includes center and states, most right? It includes everything, but we are at 3.5%. We are quarter to 4%. We have a really a long way to go to achieve that target. There would be a huge expansion required. That process has begun. It began in, 19, in the 11th five year plan and it will continue in the 12th five year plan and we need to give. You know, in the approach paper to the 12th five year plan, which we have put out on the website, yeah, yeah. Uh, that is approved by the National Development Council. Are you still sticking to 6% or? No, no, no. Uh, we are not talking about 6%. We are talking about giving overriding priority in the 12th five year plan to three sectors. Yeah. First is education and skill development. Yeah. Second is health and third is infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. What will happen is that if we want to raise the 3.5%, yeah. 3.75% now, quarter to 4%. Okay. We need to raise that. To raise that, we cannot in one plan go to 6%. Yeah. You know, because we are late started. We yeah. did not increase the expenditure as a G ratio of GDP. Yeah. 45 years are over after the Kotari Commission gave the report. But the real expansion in education sector has started only in the 11th five-year plan. Yeah. And we want to continue that process in the 12th five-year plan and possibly in the 13th five-year plan as well. Yeah. So we will be inching towards attaining the 6%, but it is uh, no gain saying that we will achieve that 6% in one plan or two plans. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, coming uh, here, I would like to also ask you about uh, uh, quality that we are delivering with the kind of funding that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, recently uh, Pratham came up with a report uh, on, uh, especially on primary education, we said mm -hmm. more, more funding has gone into uh, uh, primary uh, schooling uh, through Sarva Siksha Abhyan and other such schemes, but the outcomes are less, far less than uh, satisfactory. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you uh, deal with quality of outcome? Here, I would, when, when I talk about quality, I would also uh, want you to uh, tell us something about the the nature of pedagogy. That the the do we require a, a big fundamental shift in the mindset? Mm -hmm. in the way we teach, in the way we research? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the larger okay. question that I want to ask. That would be in the context of the higher education. Higher education. Okay, let me start with uh, primary education. Yeah. For primary education and uh, secondary education, let me say this, that there are some very strong, very positive achievements in terms of Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. There's no, uh, absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, now, in terms of the access, you know, how do we measure the access? We measure the access in terms of uh, the number of children which are out of the school. Uh, as a proportion of total, one. And second, uh, as far as the primary education is concerned, uh, what is the proportion of the habitations which are covered? Uh, how many, what proportion of habitations have a primary school within one kilometer radius? Okay. And for the secondary or for higher, uh, for elementary education, that is up to seventh or eighth, we talk about uh, availability of school in a radius of three kilometers. Okay. On both counts, we have done phenomenally well in terms of improving the access, access. of primary education. Yeah. Now I come to the second, the biggest challenge there is how to improve the quality. Yeah. This is absolutely true. Pratham reports year after year have shown that quality leaves much to be desired. Not only Pratham, for the first time we participated. But I think there are interstate variation. Yeah, but like general Madhya Pradesh shows right. good outcomes, but other states. No, no, no. But but for even the good states, when there was a testing done in, at international level, uh, at a higher level than uh, what Pratham does, yeah. it turned out that we were at the rock bottom, only okay. better than Kyrgyzstan. Okay. It was tested at the level of uh, uh, ninth and tenth standard. Okay. We were still very there, poor extremely poor. So that gives us a very strong signal that the median quality of education may it be primary, secondary or higher education, it leaves much to be desired and that is going to be focused. Decades of uh, purely state-led funding mm -hmm. uh, has not has given us less than satisfi satisfactory results in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. Now there's this big debate about the role of private sector in, in primary, secondary and higher education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. do you think the private sector can play uh, a big role in meeting this deficit that you just spoke sure, about. Sure, sure, of course. No, in fact, private sector has been playing a role, uh, but it will have to play a much bigger role in secondary education and in, uh, in, in, in the higher education. Now, th there are two reasons for that. One is connected with the quality that you are talking about. I'm not for one believe that just because uh, a private sector comes in, the quality improves. No such illusion should be there. Yeah. 
there are government schools which are doing phenomenally well yeah. so we need to to improve the quality but but the reason why private sector should be involved in a much bigger way than present is because the total requirement of funding is very large a short period of time. very large and no matter how much government desires it, they will not be able to bring about that kind of expansion yeah. because we have to work within the overall fiscal framework yeah. so therefore government funding must be supported by a, a private sector funding also and that is why in both education as well as in skill development PPP public private partnership is being emphasized only last year few months back uh, the investment in PPP is considered eligible for uh, like like the PPP in uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. so uh, investment in social sectors like education is now eligible for infra uh, uh, like uh, the other other uh, yeah. uh, investment yeah. uh, private investment in the in the sector in the infrastructure sector okay. So we are moving in that direction, but not only because of quality reasons, it's also because of the paucity of funds. And we need to do so much that no government, in spite of whatever, with the best of, most noblest of their intentions, yeah. they will require to take the private sector funding to give the push that is required. Since, since, you, since you concede that to meet the deficit, the mm -hmm. gap uh, uh, in supply, uh, scaling up of supply, mm -hmm. private sector has to play a role, supplement yeah, absolutely. the state. Yeah. Uh, do you think the private the framework for the private sector can be changed uh, in order to uh, m let them operate as as uh, as commercial uh, entities, or should they continue to operate in the present framework of of uh, societies or you know section 25 uh, yeah yeah no, I'll, I'll come to that that's a, that's a political question really yeah, yeah. Uh, i'll come to that mm -hmm. even in the public spending mm -hmm. there are very serious problems that i want you to uh, uh, please understand mm -hmm. that is that you can divide our universities into four different categories yeah. Uh, and there is a sort of caste system in our education system. Yeah, there, there is a class system. There, yeah. there is, no, caste system. Caste system, yeah. It's I, I'm a, assuming that class and caste uh, no, are overlapping. Uh, in, uh, not in here, ways, yeah. not here. Yeah. See, there are central universities which are very small in number. Yeah, yeah. That is the first category. Yeah. They have no fiscal constraint in the sense that they get more money than they can absorb. Like, like the Jawaharlal yeah. University. Yeah. You know. Take all the central yeah. universities. Yeah. Uh, then there is a second rung of universities which okay. are state universities. Okay. Now, you will be surprised that state universities are really the mainstay, mainstay. of education system because 89% of our total student population goes to state universities. 89%? Yeah. And they are the ones who are perpetually starved of we'll, funding. We'll, uh, Dr. Jadav, we'll discuss this in more detail. Sure. But after a break, uh, please don't go away and keep watching uh, Raj Sabha television. Welcome back to State of the Economy. We are having a conversation with Dr. Narendra Jadav on our education system and education reforms. Uh, Dr. Jadav, you were uh, making this very fine point that it is the state universities which are uh, delivering the bulk of the supply. Right. And uh, they are perpetually starved. Staff, of they are disproportionately starved of right. funds. Right. Uh, and and, and you were also speaking about other imbalances, uh, right. areas mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where gross enrollment is less than 5% right. in terms of sections of society. Right. Now, how do, you, uh, how do you correct these imbalances? Because this process of scaling up uh, can be done only after correcting these imbalances. There is a sequencing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you just scale up with the current distortions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you may end up with a, again a skewed education system which does not deliver in a comprehensive manner. 
Yeah, in the context of public sector, you know, what I was saying is that you don't measure public spending on education in one uh, uniform way. Yeah. It, it has a different implications for different uh, strata of uh, the education system. Yeah. Yeah. Higher education, in the higher education system, private, uni uh, the, 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 uh, the, the central universities virtually have no budget constraint. It's the state universities which lack funding. Yeah. Now, state universities, see, remember, education was once so upon a time. that private sector should be asked No, to no, no. That? I'm saying that, first of all, public sector funding should be redirected in a more um, even or more uniform manner. To the state universities. To the state universities. And okay. we are going to take special measures in the 12 year plan okay. to make sure that state universities, remember, which cover 89% of the student population, okay. they will get funding. What has happened basically is that education was once earlier a state subject. Yeah, yeah. So state universities are supposed to be funded by the states. Yeah, yeah. Then it became a subject on the concurrent list. Today what is happening is that central government is not funding them enough and state governments are not forthcoming to take care. Okay. As a result, state universities are starved and the poor quality of education is basically because of the state universities which are starved of funding. So this is a one big skew which needs to be corrected. Exactly. So even in public spending, public spending, we need to be a little more focused on state universities and in addition to the state university, in addition to public spending, yeah. it should be also supplemented by the private. Okay. That is what I'm trying okay, to say. Yeah. It's okay. a nuanced kind of it's approach. Kind of. Uh, coming back to another big issue which uh, Dr. Jadav, you are grappling with uh, sure. the policy okay. level right. is the setting up of a super regulator, right. the National Commission mm -hmm. for Education Research. Right. Right. Now, as you said, this super regulator uh, will really help in this big scale up in our education supplies, mm -hmm. big skill mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. supply that you spoke about over the next 10 years. Right, right, right. Now, what are the challenges that you're facing in setting up this regulatory system? Because my sense is that, that there's a big resistance uh, from the existing regulators and there is a certain vested interest, if I may call it, uh, on the basis of uh, the political economy of these uh, mm -hmm. existing interests mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is coming in the way of setting up of this super regulator which, 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 which is also expected to correct the skew that you are talking about. Right. Right? Right. Now how do you deal mm -hmm. with all these Western interests in our political economy which in mm -hmm. also includes our political class which is heavily invested in higher education. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, first of all, let me let me give you a perspective on the kind of reforms, yeah. uh, you know, the kind of legislative reforms which are currently underway, yeah, yeah. and there are many of them. Yeah. What you talked about, NCHER, the National Commission on Higher Education Research, is the most important one. Most important. But that's the one, National Commission on Higher Education Research. Then there is a, a bill which is pending with the parliament about the creating a regulatory authority for accreditation process. process. Third one is tribunals, yeah. state level tribunals and the central level tribunals, yeah. which will take care of... The bill. Bill that you will right, right. The fourth one is a bill for prevention of malpractices in higher education, okay. which as we all know are far too many. And the fifth one is foreign education providers. Right. These are the five major if bills. You look at the foreign invest, foreign investment. universities coming, coming in yeah, and yeah. setting up their shop here. To which also there is a big resistance at the moment. Right. No, that's fine. You know, there is a resistance to each one of these. Right. Let's go over uh, these as in terms of specifically in terms of resistance. Let's first understand what they are trying to do. NCHR, National Commission on Higher Education Research. Basically, it is intended to create not a super regulator of the kind that you are talking about, but today we have 15 different regulators, UGC, AICT, NCTE, you, you name it, yeah. all the so alphabets are covered. Yeah. There is a, the coordination between them it's is impossible. very poor, synergy between them is ex leaves much to be desired, yeah. and therefore it was conceived that there can be one big regulator which will you know, all these regulators can go. UGC will be dissolved, AICT will be dissolved, all other regulators will be dissolved, and the education part of that will be taken together okay. in terms of a one super regulator of the kind that you were talking about. Then there was a change and they made two instead of one. For the medical sciences and related subjects, there is one regulator expected, okay. and for all others, there is going to be another regulator expected. Okay. Now, what we have done is that the Prime Minister had appointed a task force we prepared the draft and then we took the draft all over the country yeah. and discussed with the political leaders 
also with the educationist academicians and we kept on revising there was a consensus the, around this we tried to build consensus yeah. there was a lot of resistance from various vested groups uh, some of them were coming out of the political economic consideration yeah but one of the most important thing that will happen if nchr comes through is that it will change the governance system of the higher education sector yeah. in fact i do believe the higher education sector would be unrecognizably different yeah. than what it is now now there is, as you rightly said, there has been resistance and we have made changes in that. Okay. Ultimately, it would be sorted out in the parliament yeah. when, when the bill comes before for, for discussion. Yeah. But there are various issues, uh, the political economy, vested interest that you mentioned about. And the political class, which is invested in higher education. Right, right. I it, mean, it, they it, are it, the it, biggest, uh, the resistors, uh, they're resisting foreign uh, universities. Some states, in. some states, uh, there is a central state issue. Take the simple case, take the simple case of appointment of vice chancellors. We want NCHER should be giving autonomy to the universities and to the vice chancellor. The autonomy presently is limited yeah. and that needs to be improved. Yeah. Now, we made a suggestion in the NCHER bill, a suggestion was made that there should be a national registry created okay. of all the, uh, all the eligible people to become vice chancellor. Okay. And individuals can nominate themselves, politicians can nominate their own people, uh, the, the government, state governments can nominate, but only subject to the scrutiny of the NCHR. So you're giving them flexibility to... And we said that any, but any university which wants uh, a, a vice chancellor to, to be appointed can take five names from the national registry okay. and choose one. If they don't fi find all five unsuitable, take another five. So, However... You should imagine, you cannot imagine the amount of resistance that we faced. That is where the political economic considerations came in. That is where politicians at the state level were up against uh, us. Uh, in so when will this be resolved? Uh, when do you think that, that this bill, th these bills will be... Parliamentary uh, democracy. Will become, become acts. acts. Yeah, it is there in the parliament. We, 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 are also Doctor, we are also running against a very stiff deadline. Right, you know, right. We, we have, have to scale, scale up in the next five, six years. Correct, correct. No, we have and to not only scale up, we have to reform the whole system. Having accepted parliamentary democracy as the, our guiding principle, uh, it will have to be the, the process of, uh, you know, the, the legislature. It has to go through the legislative course, process. We have to go through that's, parliament. Yeah. That's where it would be debated and discussed. I only hope that it would be done so realistically, sooner. Realistically, how long do you think will it take for all well, these bills to no, become no, acts? No, no, no. Nobody can... Uh, predict when it will come and when it will be discussed and what shape and form it will come out. Yeah. It is the collective wisdom of the parliament which will finally decide the shape okay. and that is how it should be. Yeah. But I am hoping personally that it will be done earlier rather than later. Okay. I am also hoping that there would be more or less uh, the same form in which it has been presented, yeah. it will come through. But uh, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jadav. Uh, we'll be back with you again with another episode. Thank you. Goodbye.